The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, we fight the war after the war and take the battle to the stars. Part one of a three-part conversation with David Weber and Richard Fox, plus a short story by Frank Chadwick from the Bain Free Radio Hour archives, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I'm Bain Associate Editor David F. Shirod, sitting in for your regular host, Tony Daniel. Today, we bring you part one of a three-part conversation with David Weber and Richard Fox about their new novel, Governor. Governor is a prequel to the David Weber classic, The Path of the Fury, and is the first in a projected new series called Ascent to Empire. But first, the news. Let's talk about eARCs. As everyone knows, eARCs are traditional cooking implements used in the making and manufacture of kale chips. Since the invention of the electric eARC, the old wooden hand-operated eARC has fallen out of fashion. However, at Bain Books, we are suckers for traditional craftsmanship. And so we are pleased to announce a line of artisan-made old-fashioned eARCs. Wait, uh, I, I think I'm getting confused here. So eARCs are actually electronic advanced readers copies or electronic advanced review copies. Uh, these are the uncorrected page proofs that publishers send to reviewers and Bain makes them available to readers as well. First up, we have To End in Fire by David Weber and Eric Flint. The huge authoritarian Solarian League lies in defeat crushed by the grand alliance of Manticore, Haven, and Grayson. Yet the League is the most economically powerful human star nation in existence. And many League citizens are deeply resentful of the fashion in which their star nation has been humbled. But there is an ongoing conspiracy far more dangerous than the bitterness of Solarian League defeat. Defeated Solarians and agents of the Victorious Alliance must join forces to bring that conspiracy deed to light, for the Mason alignment is still insidiously working toward the enslavement of humanity. Now is the time to destroy this ancient evil. Now is the time to fight the final battle and see victory through once and for all. I should mention that to end in fire, depending on when you're listening to or watching this, has been delayed but is still coming soon. Be sure to check Bain.com for updates. Next up, we have The Space Time War by Les Johnson. Humanity has finally made it to the stars. Colony worlds thrive and there is general peace among the settled systems. Until now. Matte black ships of an advanced design appear in colonial systems. Colonies and their populations are obliterated. Once settled worlds are rendered radioactive wastelands. Earth herself flies defenseless before the marauding enemy. Standing against the invasion are two of humanity's finest starship captains, Winslow Price of the British Space Navy and Anika Ahuya of the Indian Space Force. They are on a quest that will plumb the scientific wells of existence, where the primordial knot of space-time may be unraveling. Price and Ahuya are sworn to do whatever it takes to defend Earth, even if it pushes each to the brink of life and death in battle, even if it leads each beyond space and time and to the edge of ultimate possibility. And that's it for the news. And now part one of a three-part conversation with David Weber and Richard Fox. All right, we're here with David Weber and Richard Fox. They are the co-authors of the new novel, uh, which is called Governor, and it's in the Ascent to Empire series. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means and how that ties in. But gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on the Bain Free Radio Hour. Pleasure to, have, pleasure to be here. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, actually, I guess since I said that, let's talk about this. Uh, David, this book is a new novel. It really stands alone, but it also ties into a previous book you'd written. And we're sort of uh, launching this as, 
I guess, book one in a new series. So how does all that come about? Um, why return to the, the original novels, of course, um, in Fury Born, which we're uh, reissuing. Um, so well, the, path, Paths of the Fury, the which one is it? Yeah, let me, let me, okay, let me <laughs> I'll let you take this. this. Yeah, it's kind bit. of, <laughs> it's intricate. Yeah. Way back when, um, and I can't remember whether it was before or after Basilisk Station, but it was in that same time frame. Um, I did the original Path of the Fury, and I wrote the entire book in like three and a half, four weeks. Uh, it just really came together, and I really liked it a lot, and a lot of people liked it. It's Sharon's favorite book that I've ever done, um, and it was a standalone, okay? I mean, I have probably shouldn't say this out loud where people will hear it, but I have two sequels in mind for it one of these days, okay? But it it didn't leave us with hanging threads that absolutely needed to be resolved, you know, right right that instant. But I had a lot of people who asked, said, yeah, I'd really like to have it in hardcover. And I'm like, you know, mass market paperbacks don't get re-released in hardcover very often. Like, maybe once every six, seven, 8,000 years, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> um, but it occurred to me that one way to kind of kill two birds with one stone was to do a prequel to Path of the Fury, which would be my heroine, Alicia DeVries' career up to the point at which we pick up in Path of the Fury, and then get Bane to bind them together in one set of covers, which would be a hardcover at that point. So about... 50, a little bit more percent of um, In Fury Born is actually new material that was added to the original novel to put all the story in one place. Okay, so that's how that book came to be. And it hung fire for a long time because I had never before had a book that had come together that quickly and I've never had one that's come together that quickly since and I was afraid that if I did a prequel or a sequel to it I would lose some of the spontaneity or whatever it was that had worked so well in that book when I finally did the the prequel to it I think most people if they didn't know that the two books had been written the next best thing to 15 20 years apart um wouldn't realize that they had. I think that it flows well across, across the, the center divide of, of the book. But shortly after uh, I had finished uh, Path of the Fury, Jim Bain wrote me a contract uh, for two or three novels um, that would be prequels to Path of the Fury. And they would deal with Terrence Murphy and the creation of the, of the Terran Empire. And I did about um, 70,000 words on the first novel in that series when I realized that it wasn't going to work because I had not made the technology sufficiently more crude than the technology in Path of the Fury, which comes along 400 years later or something like that. And the tech obviously was critical to the tactics. And so all the tactics that I'd written wouldn't work with the tech that I was using, et cetera. So I started over and I was really beating myself up on it. I was grinding to get a thousand words a day. And I was having a conversation with Jim and he said, how's the book coming? And I said, ah, it's really not coming real well. You know, I'm having a, he said, well, why don't you write something else? I said, cause I got a contract on this book. <laughs> and he said, who's the contract with? And I said, with you. And he said, then if I tell you to write something else, go write something else. <laughs> so I went and wrote something else. And so that contract, oh, that, okay. So fast forward about three years and uh, Jim says, uh, David, I'm like, yeah. He says, you had like 80,000 words done on that prequel that you pulled off of. I said, yeah. He said, well, what if we just kind of filed off the serial numbers, changed the character names and, you know, released it as a, as a separate standalone? I said, I don't have it anymore. And he said, you mean you cannot immediately lay your hands on it? <laughs> I said, I said, no, I'm on my third computer since then. And the hard drive died on one and then some of the, among the stuff that didn't get recovered was, you know, that, that manuscript. Uh, and, you know, I didn't keep the, the hard copy of it. I, I threw it away. Oh, David, did we lose David? No. And, and I said, I said, well, I suppose that's one way to put it, okay? 
And he said, repeat after me, I will never throw anything away again. <laughs> okay. But that is actually the series that Richard and I are working on now. And it occurred to me that I really would profit by having another viewpoint on the book. And I, I was far enough away from it that I didn't have that. I have to recreate what I had the first time around right. with different tech, which was good. But Richard and I were able to discuss it. And we actually came at it in a significantly different way from the way that I had originally had it plotted out. Uh, most of the central characters around Terrence Murphy are who they were to begin with. Not uh, Iaira, especially, is not. She is very much uh, Richard's creation. We talked about the character that we needed, but he's the one who built the character that we wound up with, and I think she's one of the more interesting characters in the in the book. But the, the, the Terrence Murphy's family circle and the basic structure of the, the, uh, the Terran Federation, the Terran Republic, those are all pretty much verbatim from my original concept. And in some cases, even from my original notes on the, on the, the series. Um, Richard and I talked about it. We did story conference. We sent stuff back and forth. And then Richard went away and he wrote, with the exception of a couple of three chapters, I think the first two maybe, that I had done sort of to grease the skids and get it directed where we needed to be going. Richard did the entire first draft and sent it back to me. Um, and my fingerprints are all over what happened to the, to the final draft. But I think that's one of the strengths of this book. The characterization is has both the strengths of what I do and I think the strengths of what Richard does. And I think we managed to do it without the the weaknesses that both of us bring to, to building characters, okay? Because I was coming along and tweaking characters and dialogue and stuff behind Richard. While I think pretty much Richard, there's not, I'm, I'm thinking that there's not a single scene from the, from the draft that you gave me that isn't in the final manuscript, essentially with the skeleton and the architecture that, that you put into it. There was, there was one scene, I, I, had, a, I had a great idea for an ambush. And oh, yeah, one, well, okay, the guns that, of Navarro. <laughs> yeah, and you came back and said that the, the tech doesn't work. So I'm like, okay, it's still a good idea. I just use it later. Oh, else. but so then, then, yeah. don't throw it I, away. Then I figured out a way to make the basic scenario that he was talking about work, because when they when they do the cargo drones mm -hmm. and and stick the missiles in them, mm -hmm. it's it's basically you know it's like yeah it's a really cool idea it just won't work and I'm like wait wait if I'm sneaky enough you know so but I think that I am correct when I say that this is the first collaboration by two guys who have both won the Dragon Award for military science fiction. Yeah. Oh. Yay, yay us. Um, but <laughs> this collaboration, I think, has... This is definitely one where the sum of the two voices is, is I, think, I think, greater than either of them alone, and definitely at least as good as either of them uh, alone. Um, and Richard is actually at this very moment, uh, he has all the notes and stuff for book two. Uh, I am currently wrestling with another project which is way, way behind schedule. Um, I will not go into why. <laughs> it is way, way behind schedule, but it is way, way behind schedule. Um, so, you know, on, on the one hand, this is uh, a story that has been rattling around in my brain literally for a quarter century uh, before it got written. Um, and on the other hand, it is completely new because when I dusted off my thoughts and Richard and I started kicking it back and forth, uh, it grew and developed in some, I think, ways that I certainly had not anticipated, but that I think were very, very good ways for it to go. 
Yeah, Richard, I want to talk to you and then I want to, of course, delve into the book about um, this writing relationship and how you became, this is your, I believe, Bain debut or do, have you written some short stories in one of our uh, anthologies? You, you published uh, Going Dark. In right, Best yes. Of Third Science, and uh, that, that, that's been it for, for me. And okay, me. so yeah, so we did that reprint. Yeah, and I remember, of course, talking with you about that one. Um, well, Richard, you also did the uh, the lead, virtually the entire draft on uh, what is it, Shadows and Caves, right, the, right, the short right. story that's right. on the site on, now. Yeah. yeah, and people can go check that out. That ties into this. Uh, it's world. good. Yeah, um, I don't know if it's on the main site, but I actually uh, just posted to social media about we we do collect all those as free eBooks on the Bain Bain eBooks site, so uh, people can check it out. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to know how uh, it's great to have you as part of the Bain family um, officially as as a novelist now. Um, and uh, how you got hooked up with David, what it was like uh, coming into this world. We kind of heard his uh, history with this, but uh, what it was like for you? Well, for, for me, uh, my relationship with David started when I was about 19 years old and a, a very junior cadet at the United States Military Academy. And I had a uh, military history teacher by the name of uh, Professor Kiesling. And she and I got to talking and she said, and we were talking about uh, leadership and fiction. And she said, you need to read on Basilisk Station. And she handed me the book and I proceeded to read it and then got caught up on the, the, the very, you know, many more subsequent novels that were, that were out there for, for Honor Harrington. And I actually was, I dedicated, government, my dedication for governor is to uh, Professor Kiesling. So, and when I get to, uh, I got my 20th anniversary, 20th reunion, coming up later this summer to make me feel old. And then, but when I go oh, wait, see Wait, her, wait, wait, you were 19 <laughs> when you read the damn book, okay? Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to giving her a, a copy of the book and yeah. just so. Richard, great. if you can, if you can route that by me first. Sure thing, we'll yeah, okay. no, no problem. Yeah. yeah. And um, so then uh, David and I, we met at a writer's conference called Archer's Rest, which was held in lovely Napa, California. And, yeah, before COVID, <laughs> definitely before COVID. This last year's was canceled because of COVID, and uh, we're working on that next one there. But so, you know, Dave and I got to talking, and 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 um, I must have said something there. Dave was like, "Let me check and make sure this guy actually knows how to write." And he looked and saw that I, I did Iron Dragoons, which won the Dragon Award. So, and then he's then David said, "Hey, um, I, I'm I'm working on this one series. Would you be interested?" And it was not a hard sell for me. Right. So, <laughs> and because you know I've, I've been reading David for so long, it's like, yes, oh, okay. <laughs> What do I need to do? I was like, read this book. Okay, you yeah, read Path of Fury. And then David laid out, here's, here's the, 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 the story with Terrence Murphy. Here's where he starts. Here's how it ends up. Here are the beats I want to hit along the way. And I'm like, I can do this. Yeah, all right, easy. So, and then, um, so, and then the whole writing process of, you know, David says, here's, you know, here are the characters. Here's the tech. Here's uh, all the things I want to have happen in the first book. And then I proceeded to do a, a, a rather long, uh, outline, and then and then and David just goes off of that, and like, off I went. So well, the review function is really good for collaborators yeah. because you can tuck the notes in there, and you know. Um, but yeah, we went back and forth probably four or five times uh, on the on the outline to to get it settled. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I um, I've been more comfortable than a lot of writers doing collaborations from fairly early on. I mean, the first novel that I sold was a collaboration with Steve White. Um, and then I started doing, well, actually Jim bought my first four solo novels before Insurrection, the collaboration with Steve had come out. Um, but it's like I it's like I told Richard and like I've said other places, you know, I sold the first novel in 1989. Yes, 19 year old first reader. <laughs> um, and I'll be 69 this year. OK, uh, so over the last 32 years, I've learned a few things about writing uh, and it's a perishable skill set. OK, I mean when my Alzheimer's kicks in, they're gone, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, so I have been kind of, especially for the last several years, I have been looking for 
younger slash newer writers uh, who I think uh, are, are good uh, and with whom I can share some of those, those things that I've learned along the way and with whom I might be able to give them a little bit of a leg up in the traditional publishing world uh, because of how well established I am there. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I approached uh, Richard uh, about this. Um, there's also, um, this is also an example of one of the stories that I always wanted to write that I never found the time to write on, on my own. And I figured that if I kind of split the load on it a little bit, on the one hand, that would make it less of a total time investment for me. But the other thing that it would do is it would bring it front and center and sort of compel me to deal with it rather than saying, well, I'll get to that. I'll get to that, if, if you see what I'm saying. And sure. Richard, Richard did me proud. Uh, he really, he really I, this worked well. It worked very well. And you know, I got to appreciate David for you know, all the mentorship he's provided along the way. And it's always it's so a surprise. I, I give him ideas and David would just go, okay, that's good. But what about this? And I'll be like, oh yeah. And it's like with <laughs> the, 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 uh, the short story in Shadows and Caves, uh, I, the original thought I had was, well, let's, let's, let's do a prior space battle, et cetera, et cetera. And then David said, why don't we um, fill in some of the gaps about this one character? And I'm like, oh yeah, that we, that, that's a much better idea. <laughs> so there, there is there is a specific character in the book, and he's one of one of Richard's creations. We knew we needed him, but Richard went and built him, and built his relationship and his credentials. And there's almost a throwaway line, not an unimportant one, but just sort of a given in passing background note on him in the novel about how he got to be where he is. And so when we were looking at the short story for this, I was like, wait, let's go ahead and tell them about the, the busted operation that put him where he is today. Um, and I think, I don't know how much Richard had in mind for what the busted operation was when he wrote the scene in the book. If he, you know, I don't know whether he always knew it was going to be what he did in the short story or if like, uh-oh, Dave wants to write the short story. Now I got to figure out what the hell happened. Yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of but either way, it worked really well. Yeah. Sometimes you can like, you know, those little breadcrumbs you didn't realize you were leaving yourself maybe can lead you, you know, to to coming up with something um let's talk a little bit specifically about the world of the uh about the novel um i guess we'll maybe start big picture so what is the terran federation what is the Ter terran league how do the fringe worlds fit into this and then of course we'll dive into all these uh, characters and the specific conflicts that are going on and richard or david I'm, whoever wants to jump in uh... It's a big question, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Richard, let me let me take the first run okay. of this because they've been living in my head longer. My head can be a very crowded place, <laughs> um, especially when Skippy, you know, comes online. Anyway, um, essentially, in in Fury Born, we get a look back at the creation of the Terran Empire, and the Terran Empire. Uh, comes out of a war between the uh, Terran, uh, Terran Republic um, and the Terran Federation. Terran League? Terran League, Terran League. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, I was like, wait, wait, because I had, you know how you don't check your notes and <laughs> that's how you get into trouble? Okay, in the original manuscript, we had called, I had called it, and Richard had just followed along on the notion that the guy who created the universe knew what the hell he was talking about. Uh, I called, yeah. called the Terran Federation the Terran Republic all the way through. And then one of the copy editors said, huh? Actually, no, it was a friend of mine on the first reader's list who, who, who called it to my attention. So we changed it in the manuscript, but it didn't get changed on the dust jacket yeah. of the book. So yeah. it's referred to the Terran Republic there, whereas it's actually the Terran Federation. Okay. Um, but 
the the Terran Federation and the Terran uh, the Terran League uh, come out of uh, a great power rivalry on Earth, if you will. China loses the Great Eastern War um, and is saddled with the the war guilt, and, and they deserved it. Okay, I mean you know, uh, but. In the middle of all this, uh, people begin uh, doing interstellar colonization and uh, eventually a faster than light drive is invented. The original colonies are primarily, uh, the first few are like privately funded uh, expeditions. And then some of the states in the, uh, the uh, Terran, the, 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 the Federated Government of Earth, which is everybody but China. China has, and some of its uh, Asian allies have refused to join because they feel like they're being compelled to join that they'll have to make all kinds of concessions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so members states of the federated government begin planting colonies and uh, China uh, and, uh, and its um, allies uh, begin planting colonies in competition they don't have the resources, they don't plant as many, et cetera. Then the, the faster than light drive comes in and planets begin, planets that are further out are now reachable. And the league and the, what becomes the Terran Federation sort of expand away from one another because they're being created in rivalry. Uh, so you fast forward another two, 300 years and the, um, human expansion has uh, impacted on the borders of the Rishathan sphere. The Rish are the, the um, they're, in, they're an important secondary thread in, in Fury Born. They are the primary space going rival of humanity. Um, and the Rish uh, who are, they look Saurian, but they're actually not. I mean, you know, they're not an exact analog for anything from Earth. Uh, they are a matriarchal species. The, the, uh, the females are much, much larger and far more ferocious than, than, the, than the males. They analyze humanity and they realize that humans are more fertile than the rich. They are more uh, technologically inventive than the rich. And they like lower population densities than the rich do. And therefore, it occurs to them that these cockroaches are now loose in the galaxy, and they're going to wind up grabbing all the good, you know, good uh, territory, and we don't like that. So they come up with a plan to play upon the lingering hostility between the League and the Federation, which has largely died down by this point. I mean, it's still there. It's kind of a traditional thing, you know. Uh, they figure out how to play upon it to push these two human polities into a war. And they do it by manipulating terrorists on both sides. They do it, well, actually primarily on the league side. Uh, they do it by engineering incidents that are then blamed on by the humans on each side. And they are the good friends of both sides. They are trying to be the honest broker between them as things get. And somehow the honest broker always sort of comes back with failure to quiet things down. And by the time this novel begins, the war has been going on for about a half century. Um, and there's like, you know, like 56 billion dead uh, kind of thing. And the Rish are basically, they have an end game in mind. And the end game is for these two human polities to bleed one another until they reach a point at which the Rish can sweep in and, and clean up the leftover pieces. All right. So that's the background for the war that is going on that Terrence Murphy is involved in. Now, there are some interesting social dynamics on both sides. And uh, I will let Richard tell you uh, about the 500. All right. <laughs> uh, and their attitude towards the war. Right. Uh, so within the the, the, the republic, um, there are established families within the federation. Federation, excuse See, me. There you go. <laughs> you still think I know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 
sorry, excuse me. Within the Federation, there's a established families, long, very rich group of, group of people who kind of form an oligarchy within the Federation. And they're known as the 500 families. And they're centered around Earth in the initial sphere of colonies, pretty far away from where the League got settled. And when the war started, they had all, they had a good deal of space between where the, the front was and where the home systems were. That's where all the fringe worlds were mm -hmm. at. So the, the, the 500 decided that, okay, we're going to have this war and then they're going to, you know, they're going to be the ones who provide all the bullets, all the ships, all the supplies. And in the process, they're getting rich during the whole course of this war. And then also they found a way to protect their own interests, because if you are one of the 500s and you're a family member of the, five, uh, of the 500, you don't get drafted, you have an economic exemption so that therefore everyone within the 500, they never feel the sting of the loss of being out there on the front lines. So the fringe worlds, these, these further out colonies that, that weren't as economically powerful, uh, they're the ones who had to provide all the manpower. So the 500, they provide uh, uh, bullet and bullets and money for the war. The fringe provides the blood. And then after so many decades of constantly sacrificing you know, their, their future generations to this war, the fringe is like, hey, we're getting a little bit tired of this here. And so, and then you know, th there's a long simmering and we made references to, there have been a couple of rebellions against uh, the burdens placed on these fringe worlds. And then finally in, in governor, uh, this, this spills over um, the, the threat that the fringe is facing and they feel like they're not being actually being protected by the 500. And now it's kind of time for the Federation to, you know, to, to deal with this, this, this simmering angst that's been going on for, for many decades. Something that, that um, I think Richard may have actually interjected uh, in, into the mix. Um, I mean, it was there in the back of my brain, but I think Richard uh, jogged it to the front, um, is that not only is, are the 500 uh, getting rich off of the war, but they are also using their control of the government to choke out any competing industrial bases and whatnot in the fringe that would cut into their war profits. And they're doing it on the basis of centralized efficiency, blah, 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 blah. But what it means is that for at least the last 30 years at the time of this book, they have been systematically preventing the fringe from developing an industrial base of its own. And part of this, which is not so much explicitly looked at until very late in the book is that they want to make darn sure that no fringe system has the sinews of war that it would need to successfully flout directives from <laughs> from the uh, the uh, the Terran capital um, and actually that's one of the things that makes them so nervous about Terrence Murphy because he uh, is in the system of Edinburgh, of Edinburgh. Um, Silver Tree? Yeah, Silver Tree. I'm like, boy, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm like, okay, fine, I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, Silver Tree is, has been recently refurbished uh, as a forward support base its industrial capacity has been upgraded, not hugely. It's certainly not, you know, like a core world or anything like that, but it has the ability to not just service ships, but to, for example, build munitions, which is something that fringe systems are forbidden to do. And in order to protect the, the, um, the system against attack, Murphy authorizes them to build their own missiles to do it. And of course, this is a huge red flag for everybody back home that, you know, he's, he's, this is not, no, <laughs> this is bad. This is yeah. bad. <laughs> you know, they, they actually have uh, uh, general orders on the books for what naval personnel are supposed to do if the system goes out of compliance um and it's it's pretty ugly um 
And so they decide that back home, they decide that that's what Murphy has done. And it's worth noting also that Murphy's grandfather was basically the creator of the Terran Federation Navy. He's what took the, the, the basically almost the Coast Guard level fleet that they had and turned it into an actual war fighting fleet, which he did more because he was concerned about the Rish than because he was concerned about the League, but still. Um, and uh, his father, Murphy's father, uh, died uh, in a naval battle, uh, which he is blamed for losing when in fact it was not his fault. Um, and Murphy, the Murphy family probably was on the very fringe of the 500, no matter what, but he married into the 500. Uh, he married um, uh, Simran, uh, who is the only daughter of one of the like two, maybe three uh, uh, major uh, shipbuilders of the, of the Federation. And most people think of him as a clothes horse who wants to go play with exploration ships. Right. And he's been at some length to convince them <laughs> that that's what he wants to do. But he actually has something rather different uh, in mind. Um, there's uh, a, uh, a sequence uh, that takes place uh, in Silver Tree uh, on the planet that Murphy winds up defending, and which, by the way, Alicia DeVries' mother's family is from in uh, the uh, Imperial Born book. Uh, and when you've read Governor, you understand why that side of her family is really, really loyal to the House of Murphy. I mean, that, that's, I'll just leave it at that. But the, one of the scenes that Richard created um, revolves around poppies. Um, and uh, Richard, I totally did not see it coming uh, in the first scene in the governor's mansion where you make reference to the picture of the rope with the poppies on it. It didn't even cross my mind where you were going with that. But then as we got closer to like mustering in day and whatnot, I realized where you were going. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Right. Uh, what was with Silver Tree, it's, I wanted to, you know, here's a planet that's been giving its all to the war effort for so long. And the governor, uh, he was one of the, the first draftees. He was like, oh, the war will be over. No, the, 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 the planetary president, Murphy's right. the governor. Excuse me. Yeah, Excuse me. yeah. Yeah, the, the planetary president of the, the, the potentate for the, the local yeah. colony. He, he was one of the first, you know, people who volunteered to go to the war. You know, think 1914 when the, the, the picture of thousands and thousands of young men going, oh boy, it's a war, how much fun is that going to be? And then, you know, we'll be home by Christmas. I don't want to miss out on this chance. He yeah. was one of those. And he uh, lose, lost a couple parts of himself uh, along the way. And then uh, during, as the war progressed, I think I forgot the number, but all of his sons died in the war. And Three, three sons yeah. died in the war and only his daughter uh, who wasn't drafted survived and she went on she had, had grandkids and then so it, it occurred to me that okay this planet has been you know sending up their youth for decades and when they come back they either one don't come back at all two come back broken and losing pieces or they've you know suffering somehow so my thought is okay after decades of this this planet has kind of had to to learn to deal with with this somehow. So then I, I thought, well, let's, let's go back to history. Well, you know, what were some of the, the symbols of this sacrifice? And I thought back to World War I, because I'm a big World War I historian. And then, you know, you, you have uh, the, the poppies uh, from World War I Flan on Flanders Field, and, and then how those became, you know, a big symbol of the war. And they still are. Uh, you, if you see poppies, they, you see them a lot around uh, Veterans Day or uh, uh, um, Lost in Action. And oh yeah yeah so so i thought okay here's something i can you know incorporate is one it's, it's it's founded in current history so when i start throwing out little hints about poppies you know his people who are historic historically minded they go aha i know it's coming and then when when that actually does come to the fore with the big ceremony involving you know the, how, how they're mustered all the readers who were thinking about this and you know, they, they, they see their thoughts come to the fore like, ah i'm smart i figured it out and you know <laughs> I mean, readers love that, and then well, it, also it's, thematically it works very well for the story. 
So, well, it worked. It works for the story really well in two regards. One, it it is a powerful scene, uh, uh, no matter what. But it also it's the moment at which um, at which Murphy returns and tells Edinburgh that they're about to be under attack. I have to deal with this. Hang on. <laughs> we can, but, we'll, we'll. So, but when uh, let me, I'll fill in the gap here. So. It gets to the point where you have this final mustering where Murphy shows up and then the, the planetary uh, president sees his granddaughter come up. Right. And yeah. She's about to go. And it's like, oh, my gosh, I gave up all my sons. Now my grandchildren are going. Mm -hmm. And that's when he says, that's it. Yeah. That's it. We can't we can't do this anymore. So it was uh, it was it, it, that that whole storyline built up pretty well. Yeah. To that scene. Yeah, that was a, a great moment in the book. Um, tour towards the end or second half at least um i was well actually just as a side note let me not a side note i thought it was interesting in here how you have the the draft essentially working is sort of this uh, concept of preference versus need uh you want to talk about that and where that came from that you know i i, I came up with that and i'm not exactly sure how it happened but it occurred to me that you know if you're going to serve you know i i did 10 years in the united states army i did i did I, I deployed twice to Iraq and, you know, I was an officer. I didn't enlist, but it, it you know, it occurred to me that, okay, how is the state going to kind of squeeze the most out of people? And if you're on the fringe and you don't have a lot of economic opportunities, you don't have the industry is not there. You don't have the, the, the sciences aren't there. So if you're some a kid from the fringe and you really want to get ahead in life, you're going to go for uh, preferences and you're going to say, I want to go be a doctor, send me to be a medic and doctor. And then the state says, yeah, come on in. We'll, we'll give you that extra training and make you a nurse. We'll make you a technician. We'll make you a, an engineer, whatever. But then the state can pull on you again as it wants. So it's kind of insidious that the state's mm -hmm. saying, oh yeah, we'll, we'll give you what you want. Here's a great enlistment bonus, $20,000. Sure. Go ahead. And then it's kind of a trap. So all these people who went in, all who enlisted for their preferences, they're actually, you know, giving up years and years of their life, potentially, because the state says, we're going to recall you whenever we need to, because we spent all this extra money on you. And then you have the people who go in for needs, who are almost certainly thrown into the meat grinder as infantry or, you know, um, it just whatever, I want to say jobs within the military that have a high turnover. And maybe you don't need to be the most... Uh, you know, the most savvy tech wise, but after that, but if you do your three years, I think it was three years, then you're done, done. Yeah. But if you go for preferences, you do five years and then they could call you back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but also if you, if you go needs of the service, they're like, well, we need a lot of light infantry right mm -hmm. now. Uh, as opposed to, well, I would really rather be a radar tech, uh, kind of thing. So it, uh, Richard's right. It is insidious. It also makes perfectly good sense from the perspective of the of the military because they need these guys, and the guys who are going to go for the preferences are probably going to be the ones in the in the the uh, positions where they need the longest. You know, they need to maintain as big a pool of experienced personnel as they can. Um, but it does mean that once again. Uh, the the cost of the war falls most heavily on those who have the least resources. Um, there's there are resonances in this, I think, um, to both World War One and to the Vietnam conflict, uh, in the fact that the 500 are definitely at the mall uh, while the fringe is is at war. Um, now there are friend there are members of the 500 who serve. Uh, for example, um, Terrence's brother-in-law, uh, Regenda, um, and who, you know, I mean, they're out there on the front line, but they almost always go in with advantages that are going to get them there as officers, not grunts, and that are going to see their ticket being punched before those of, of other people. Fringers provide a lot of ship captains, but very few admirals, for example. And partly that's because uh, the, the heart worlds, then the 500, don't trust 
Fringer admirals because they know what they'd do if they were Fringer admirals and somebody had been doing to them what they've been doing to the Fringe. There's a lot of projection coming out of the 500 where the Fringe is concerned, to be honest. Um, and that too is, is something that was part of my thinking, but that I think Richard helped develop um, uh, a lot, uh, a lot better. Um, and uh, Richard did, Richard built the, the scene where one of the fringe worlds is basically depopulated mm. by uh, a, a Republican admiral. And that's, this is where we meet, uh, meet Yaira um, for the first time. And I think it's a very powerful sequence. And we'd discussed it. I knew, you know, what was, what was going to be in there. Uh, but I was really pleased with how you handled that, uh, Richard. Um, I think it, I think it worked well. Um, now I did, I did uh, the naval, conf the naval battles in here because I built the naval tech. Richard didn't. Um, and Richard, Richard does is like big stumpy armor, and I'm good to yeah. go. I mean, you know that, <laughs> that, 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 you know, and he does it really, really well. But naval tactics, no, he was army, you know, mm -hmm. you know, things like water and space, you know, they kind of. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> he likes mud. Okay, he likes dirt. <laughs> you know? But anyway, um, the um, and that was kind of where we were on his guns of Navarone. I, I don't know whether it's pronounced Navarona, Navaroni. I think maybe it's Navarona. Anyway, um, from the Alistair McLean novel uh, is where I'm, I'm coming from, where he wanted to use the ambush planet. Um, and I actually did find a way to make that work. Um, he, he kind of pushed me into building more Navy stuff than I'd had in mind originally, because it's really cool the way that it finally works out. Um, but he really shines i think when he's looking at the dynamics of the hoplons the the armored infantry yeah. and marines who are um sort of the, the the elite of the of the federation's ground forces and ship boarding personnel um, i had not planned on doing the hoplons at all uh, in my original thinking about this, I had planned on there being powered armor, and I had planned on its being substantially less well developed than where we were by the time Alicia came along. Um, Richard took it and ran with it and did some really cool stuff. But there were a couple of things that he wanted to do that I couldn't let him do because the tech just wasn't there, um, like your your shields. Um, I really liked that, but there was not. I couldn't, I couldn't think of a way within the tech envelope that we had to make it work, but I was able to give you your swords. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it was really good. Um, and I was really pleased with, it. I especially like Logan and, uh, what's our, our Fringer, uh, Shaman's name. You remember her? Oh, I, I don't remember, but I remember I gave her shark. Shark. Yes. Tattooed. Her tattooed, her tattooed yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think the scene, okay. Iaira survives the attack on the planet. She's not her home world because she's not even a citizen of the Federation before this whole thing starts. Uh, she's a liberated slave who's been sterilized, you know, and, you know, and she's like about 18, 19 years old, I think, when we meet her. And she's a very dangerous person. Uh, and this becomes evident when she, when she hears the voice of the governor who left her and her brother to die, and her brother did. Uh, I loved that that scene, you know, yeah. when Richard put it together. I was like, okay, I, I, I like this girl. <laughs> um, but she is also, and, you know, this is a little bit of a spoiler, but not much, I think. She is basically the first member of the imperial cadre that Alicia winds up joining 300 years later. It doesn't exist because there's no empire when we meet her. Mm -hmm. But when the Imperial Cadre is set up, she's going to be like the founding member for all intents and purposes. But there's a 
beautiful scene that Richard built in here where they got to figure out how to not execute Eira for trying to murder the governor. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, you know, everybody's <laughs> like, well, governor needed to be murdered, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, kind of. So they basically wind up taking her into, into the service. She enlists so they don't have to send her back with all the rest. And the idea is that they're going to train her to be like a, a, a inner layer of security for Murphy and his son who are out here in the fringe. And the theory is that people will think that she is like, you know, uh, the, the staff prostitute kind of thing when she'll actually be this really dangerous person. And there's this wonderful scene where she goes to the, uh, 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 Sergeant Major Logan, the commander of the Hoplon detachment to be, you know, to be beginner training. And the, the, phrase that Richard dropped in there that I loved is after he has this whole conversation with her in which he he corrects a few of her misconceptions and he explains you know what he's going to do here you know and everything else and she's like she's like okay and he says he says now this is the last time I'm going to be speaking pleasantly to you (laughs) and I thought you know I have known a lot of of retired non-coms over the years and I could hear any one of them saying that (laughs) and it just rang so true I love that entire scene in the gym yeah it it, that those 10 years in the army were were good for something (laughs) that was the first part of my chat with David Weber and Richard Fox tune in next week for part two and now we present a short story from the Bain Free Radio Hour archives Part one of Frank Chadwick's steampunk tale, Murder on the Hockflieger Ost. Murder on the Hochflieger Ost by Frank Chadwick. Minnick Bavaria, aboard the landed Hochflieger Ost, December 10, 1887, late afternoon. Gabrielle Courbier finished pinning up her hair and looked in the stateroom mirror to be certain she was presentable. She was. Men told her she was more than simply presentable, that she was in fact strikingly beautiful. If asked to describe her own appearance, she would have said it was ordinary in every respect, not usually tall or short, figure neither exceptionally heavy nor thin, facial features very regular. It occurred to her, and not for the first time, that it was odd how men found the average of feminine characteristics so exceptional. She accepted this judgment on its face. She had no means of judging its validity, as she did not find women sexually arousing herself. Gabrielle had difficulty understanding any emotion which she did not herself experience, and so the feeling of others remained generally elusive, and their behaviors often surprising and seemingly irrational. Despite the potentially fatal consequences of such a disability in a spy, the men who headed the intelligence apparatus of the Democratic and Social Republic of France had given Gabrielle this covert assignment of a most critical nature. They had done so because she, who until then had worked only in the research department, asked for it and provided an extensive list of arguments as to why she was the correct choice, a list which would have been tiresomely long coming from any other aspirant, but which her male superiors had listened to with the appearance of rapt attention, although in truth few of them would have afterwards been able to tell you even a fraction of what she had said. Her assignment, while requiring both discretion and brazenness in turn, did not seem very difficult. She was to contact an anarchist agent and exchange one leather document tube for another. They would make the exchange on the Hochflieger Ost, the enormous and luxurious commercial zeppelin, which linked Berlin to Istanbul by way of Munich, Vienna, and Budapest. Gabrielle had boarded the Zeppelin in Berlin early that morning, and the other agent was to board here in Munich. 
once aloft over Austria and the Balkans, legal jurisdiction would be problematic, and they could make the transfer with greater safety, at least from the authorities. The presence of hostile agents was always a danger to be guarded against, of course. Gabrielle opened her purse and made sure the small Le Faucheux revolver was where she had positioned it. She pursed her lips. She would far rather have brought a shotgun for protection, but it would surely have been confiscated upon boarding. As this unsatisfactory toy-like revolver was all she had managed to conceal, it would have to do. Gabrielle did not know what the anarchist looked like. She only knew he would be traveling on a British passport, and he had been told to contact the attractive blonde French lady traveling alone. Gabrielle hoped the agent's notion of an attractive female corresponded to that of her superiors. She thought that aspect of the plan troublesomely vague. Among the qualifications she had listed for the assignment was her fluency in both German and English, although she had omitted the fact that her English was learned from books, and so she had little grasp of conversational idioms. Gabrielle had already decided that, to the extent feasible, she would conceal her knowledge of foreign languages in the hopes of provoking a loose comment or admission. Mentally reaffirming this part of her plan, she finished dressing quickly and left her cabin for the main salon, where she believed she stood the best chance of contacting the agent among the throng of boarding passengers. Do you have any firearms or incendiaries? Certainly not. Do you take me for the anarchist? Etienne Villon, who was in fact exactly that, declaimed these words with what he imagined to be the outrageous arrogance of an Englishman. He waved the folded document in his hand at the corpulent Bavarian customs clerk. I have the passport Britannique. The official took the forged passport from him, but eyed him with suspicion. Forgive me, he paused to read the name on the document, Herr Le Marchand. But you do not sound English, nor does your name sound English. English? I am a subject of the British crown, but certainly not English. I am Genesier from the island of Guernsey. The official frowned and read the passport more carefully. Guernsey? I have never heard of this. Genesier, Etienne repeated impatiently, his pretended anger beginning to give way to the real thing. From Guernsey. Ach, ja, it says it here. You are from the island of Guernsey. Yes, Guernsey, you. Great. He choked off the expletive and took a breath to calm himself. It would do no good to enrage this representative of the German state apparatus. Frowning, the customs official spread the forged passport on his counter and selected a large and forbidding-looking rubber stamp from the rack in front of him. We have the long and glorious tradition of service to the Anglaise, Etienne added hastily. My grandfather was a general, Jean Le Marchand. The official stamped the passport and handed it back. You may board now. He commanded Wellington's cavalry at Salamanca. We thrashed those despicable Frenchies that day. Ja, ja, move along, bitte, the official said, his attention already on the overweight lady and her bored daughter standing next in line. Etienne, who was short and not particularly strong, puffed with exertion, carrying his valise and the vitally important document tube, up the folding metal stairway to the Zeppelin's boarding hatch. Perspiration suddenly ran down his face, and not simply from the physical labor. That was close, he thought. Ever since he had taken this assignment, his life had hung by the most slender of threads. The slightest misstep or mistake would surely lead to exposure, arrest, torture, and death. But what did it matter? The cause, only the cause, mattered. What was his life compared to the cause of freedom? Nothing. 
His life was nothing and he would gladly give it for freedom, for freedom and justice and truth. Truth was the most important cause of all, he thought, and he pocketed his forged passport. Gabrielle took her place at a small table in the salon, chosen for its excellent view of the doors at either end of the long room. She ordered café au lait and thought through the mission. A member of a covert anarchist organization called the Chevalier Autonome du Peuple, independent Knights of the People, had stolen a complete set of engineering drawings of a new and quite advanced design of British ether battleship, to be christened the Prince of Wales. Unfortunately, the theft was discovered almost at once, and all traffic across the Pas de Calais closed to prevent the agent's escape to France. He had instead made his way by fishing boat to Norway, and then had been helped to Munich by Volksritterbund, the German branch of his organization generally known simply as Der Bund. Once they made contact, she would exchange a sheaf of charcoal-sketched landscapes of the French countryside for the ether battleship plans, each rolled up in identical brown leather carrying tubes. I beg your pardon, miss, but are you bound for Istanbul? Two middle-aged gentlemen, one lean and one portly, occupied the table to her left. The heavier men who sat closer to her had asked the question in English. Although she understood him perfectly well, she gave him a puzzled look. Pardonnez-moi? Ah, French, he said to his lean companion, whose attention seemed more on his newspaper than the conversation. Well, damn me, eighteen months ago, in Belgium, we and the Huns were shooting them down like swine, and now frogs ride on the zeps as pretty as you please. He turned back to Gabrielle and spoke slowly and loudly. You, and he pointed forcefully to her several times, go, making a motion in the air back and forth with his left hand perhaps representing the passage of the Zeppelin, although Gabrielle could not be sure. Is tan bull, he finished, and put his four fingers pointing up from the top of his head like a bull's horns. Gabrielle laughed. Ah, <laughs> we, oui, Istanbul. Jolly good, he said, and then turned back to his companion. Nothing like a French tart to liven up the landscape. His friend lowered the newspaper and looked at Gabrielle for a moment, nodded politely to her, and then went back to his reading. Best keep your mind on our business, the slender man said. Well, damn me. Speak of our business and in it walks, the first man said. His companion again lowered the newspaper, and the two of them watched a new arrival carry his bags through the entryway and toward the bar. Armbruster, the portly man added, and his lips curled in a sneer as he said it. That chap behind the Prince of Wales' mess, his companion said, folding the newspaper and now clearly interested. That's the one, a bounder for certain. We'd best keep an eye on him. The Prince of Wales, the name of the stolen ether battleship plans, Gabrielle felt a surge of excitement. Had she, by sheer chance, taken a seat by the very British agents she would have to guard against on this mission? And had she already identified the agent she was to contact? Trying not to show any particular interest, she followed their gaze and saw a tall man shouldering his way through the crowd. He certainly dressed as an Englishman, in tweeds, and he carried a circular leather document tube over one shoulder. It was not exactly the same as hers, larger and a lighter shade of brown leather, which was inconvenient, but how was Der Bund to know the exact dimensions and color of the case she would bring? Without looking at the two British agents beside her, she recalled their exact words another of her particular talents, and combed through them for any additional clues. Most of the words she understood, but what was a bounder? The English always mispronounced foreign words, sometimes she thought as a matter of pride. Could he have meant a member of Der Bund? And the lean British agent had described this new arrival as a 
chap. What was a chap? Some sort of code, perhaps. What could it... Ah, uh, of course. Chevalier autonome du peuple. Chap. The tall man stopped by the salon bar, lowered his valise and document case to the desk, and ordered a drink from a steward. Maintaining an appearance of outward calm, Gabrielle finished her café au lait and left a ten-fennic coin beside the saucer. She rose and crossed the crowded salon toward the men who, whiskey glass in hand, now watched her approach. He raised an eyebrow in quiet inquiry, and she answered in kind, bringing a knowing smile to his face. Aware that the British agents would be watching, she did not look at him, or address him directly when she reached his side, but instead stood with her hands on the railing beside the large glass windows which overlooked the landing ground and stretching away behind it the city of Munich. Her eyes on the crowd below, she said in a quiet voice meant only for his ears, Bonjour, monsieur. You are perhaps interested in a French lady traveling alone? Before answering, he took a large swallow of whiskey. You must have read my mind, he replied. I hardly think it necessary. Your accent is quite good, by the way. Well, why wouldn't it be, he said. That was true, she thought. An agent passing for British would have paid special attention to this detail. Do you perhaps uh, have some pictures to show me? she said. Pictures? he repeated and then smiled. Why, yes, I have some very fine etchings in my stateroom I think you may find quite interesting. Bon, she said. Below the window the ground crews made ready to unmoor the zeppelin. Their shadows stretched behind them, rendered long and grotesque by the angle of the setting sun. The ship would be aloft in a few minutes. Gabrielle made a quick calculation as to how long before they would be safely over Austrian airspace. I will come to your cabin at eleven this evening. What is the number? He took another swallow of whiskey and then fetched a key from his pocket. One seven nine, he said. One seven nine, she repeated. Eleven this evening. Without looking at him, she turned and left. Waldo Armbruster watched her leave, watched her walk the length of the salon and felt a glow in his lower body, not entirely the result of the whiskey. How could he be so lucky with women and so damned unlucky at Baccarat? That was a mystery, which sometimes plagued him, but wouldn't trouble him much tonight, he imagined. He picked up his valise and the cylindrical leather fly-rod carrier and set off to find his stateroom. A few minutes later, Etienne Villon, a.k.a. Etienne Le Marchand, entered the salon and found a prominent place in the center of the room where he would be clearly visible to the French agent and where he might pick her out as well. How many attractive French ladies would be traveling alone on a zeppelin? Not many, he hoped. He waited for an hour, waited as the crowd gradually thinned. He felt more and more exposed and alone, more and more as if he had walked into a trap. Soon he became certain of it. Very well. If the English had trapped him, then he would at least show them how a man of ideals, a man of principles, could die with dignity. Although his stomach churned with anxiety and he felt slightly nauseous, he squared his shoulders and looked around the room with an expression of haughty disdain. Ten minutes later, the steward's staff asked him to leave so they could set the tables for supper. To his surprise, no one attempted to arrest him when he did so. Later that evening, Waldo Armbruster rose from his chair in response to the knock at his stateroom door. He examined his pocket watch and his eyebrows went up. Almost an hour early, he said to himself. The young darling must have been particularly captivated by my charm.
He drained the brandy and soda, his third, and walked somewhat unsteadily to the door. Throwing it open, he prepared to greet the delicious French lady, but his smile vanished. Oh, I can explain. At eleven o'clock precisely, Gabrielle turned the corner in the corridor which led to State Room 179 and saw a small crowd of a dozen or so people in the passageway talking among themselves. As she grew near, she realized the crowd milled before the open door to the very stateroom she wished to visit. You must clear the passageway, a white-coated steward said in German and made pushing motions with his hand. All passengers will please return to their cabins at once, by order of the Hauptzahlmeister. Gabrielle wondered what would have brought the Hauptzahlmeister, the vessel's chief purser, here. What has happened? she asked in German of a couple turning to leave. A murder, the woman answered. Quite ghastly, they say. A great deal of blood. Gabrielle pushed on through the thinning crowd of passengers and saw the two British agents leaving in the opposite direction. Were they behind this? What else was she to think? When she reached the doorway, the steward held out his hand as if to stop her. No, my dear lady, you must return to your cabin at once. But I have important business with the man in this cabin. If there has been foul play, I may know the reason why. Foul play, she heard a deep voice from inside the stateroom repeat. A tall, stout man of middle age, dressed in white tie and tails, appeared beside the steward. He was clearly not a member of the crew, and yet the steward immediately deferred to him. Baron Renfrew, the steward said. This lady says she had business with the deceased. What sort of business? the baron asked. Gabrielle opened her handbag and retrieved one of the business cards her superiors had provided as a cover for her mission. It read, Madame Gabrielle Courbière, Commissaire Priseur des Beaux-Arts, 13 Rue Madeleine, Le Havre, France. A praiser of fine art, the baron said. I did not suspect Armbruster's tastes ran to that. Gabrielle instantly noticed three things. The baron had no difficulty in reading French. He apparently knew the agent, and the agent's assumed name was Armbruster. As to his tastes, I have no opinion. Having met him only once and briefly, she said, he corresponded with me and said he had a number of previously unknown charcoal sketches of the French countryside by Jean-François Millet. Millet? the baron asked. Oui, Millet was one of the founders of the school Barbizon. If the landscapes are authentic, they are quite valuable. I paid Monsieur Arambraster a considerable sum in advance— with the balance to be delivered if I could determine it their authenticity. I have a proprietary interest in them, you see. He carried them in the cylindrical leather case. Was such a case found? The baron's expression flickered in surprise. Cylindrical case? You'd better come in, he said, and the steward immediately stood aside and bowed. Wait out here and see that we are not disturbed the baron added to the steward. Etienne Villon closed the door of his stateroom behind him and leaned against it, his head reeling. His aimless wandering looking for the French agent had led him to the crowd at the murder scene, and there he had seen the woman who must be his contact, the overheard discussion of the landscape charcoals, her French accent, and above all her dizzying beauty left no doubt in his mind. He had not dared to make contact with her in public, but now he seethed with anxiety. He saw her talking with Baron Renfrew. 
saw her enter the stateroom and the door close behind her. Was it possible she did not know she stood face to face with the very embodiment of everything they fought against? No. Surely a French agent would know that man on sight and understand the terrible menace he represented. But she had walked into unspeakable, terrifying danger without a trace of fear or even of hesitation. This was bravery of an order he had never witnessed before. Extraordinary bravery and celestial beauty combined in one woman and all of it dedicated to their common cause, a woman truly worth dying for. He must find a way to rescue her. It seems to me the man simply fell and hit his head on the corner of this small table, the slender ship's doctor said as he polished the lenses of his pince-nez glasses. Beside him the chief purser nodded rapidly, but with a look of clear distress on his ruddy, black-whiskered face. Gabrielle could imagine numerous reasons why he would prefer an accident to a murder. She took a step closer and examined the body. Armbruster lay on his stomach, with the small wooden table beside him. A corner of the table top was jaggedly broken off, and the left side of the man's skull was cracked open, brains exposed. That was quite interesting. She had never before seen a man's brains. There was also, as the lady in the corridor had suggested, a considerable amount of blood, which had begun to coagulate, but was by no means dry. Much of it had puddled on the hardwood deck around the dead man's head, but she also saw evidence of a fine spray of blood, probably from the impact with the table. She noticed that no one had stepped in the blood, so that aspect of the scene was certainly undisturbed. Perhaps he fell, she said. Or perhaps it was staged to look this way, n'est-ce pas? If this was an accident, the drawings will still be here. The doctor forcefully put his pince-nez glasses back on and scrawled, clearly annoyed to have his opinion contradicted. The chief purser shook his head in alarm. No, you must leave this to us, Madame Corbière, the purser said, but the baron cleared his throat and the two other men immediately turned to him. Considering the strained international situation, the baron said, and the delicate relations between Germany and France, the Zeppelin line may prefer you to exercise a special consideration for this lady's business interests. Although to Gabrielle's ear the baron offered this as if solicitor's advice, not a command, the chief purser straightened to attention. Of course, Herr Baron, danke schön. Now let us find this case. For the next ten minutes, the four of them, Gabriel, the Baron, the Doctor, and the Chief Purser, searched the small cabin for the leather document tube, but found nothing but a half-empty bottle of brandy, a small book of solicitous photographs, slightly more than twenty pounds sterling in British currency, and armbrusters' clothing and toiletries. He had the leather case with him when he bought it this afternoon, Gabrielle insisted. The lady is unfortunately correct, the doctor told the chief purser. I saw it myself. The chief purser stared in appeal at the doctor for a moment, but then his shoulders sagged and he shook his head. Ach, a murder. Never before has there been a murder on the Hochflieger Ost. When we land in Vienna later today, the authorities will want to know everything. Our passengers will be detained. It will be a great embarrassment for the firm. Ah, you baron, of course, will not be inconvenienced. The baron nodded his acknowledgement of what was apparently obvious to everyone but Gabrielle. You are perhaps the owner of this line? she asked. He gave her a quizzical smile in return. I have no formal association with the Zeppelin firm. The chief purser allowed me to be present as a courtesy. Armbruster was a fellow countryman and uh, an acquaintance. 
He did not say friend, Gabriel noticed. A countryman? You are English. Your German is quite good. Not exactly English. Welsh, I suppose. He paused and smiled again as if at a private joke. My family is originally from Germany. I still have relatives there. Ah, très bien. Now as to the murder, the chief person is concerned with the delay and scandal, we. Oui? But if we discover the criminal ourselves before we reach Vienna, all will be well. The man who has the missing case is surely our murderer. The man or men, she thought. But how shall we proceed? the chief purser asked, and looked at the others in desperation. The doctor answered in a voice clearly accustomed to giving commands. I see no alternative to a polite but insistent search of the passenger cabins for the missing tube. The chief purser began to object, but the doctor waved him to silence and pressed on. Surely the Viennese police will do the same, and with less consideration for our passengers and less discretion. The baron frowned in thought for a moment and looked up when he realized the other men were waiting for his opinion. Yes, I do not suppose there is a good alternative. Gabriel took one last look around the floor of the stateroom to see if anything was amiss, a button perhaps, fortuitously lost from the murderer's coat or something dropped from a pocket, but she saw nothing out of place. She did notice that the baron's shoes were polished almost to a mirror brightness, but there were three very small dull dots on them, three spots where they did not reflect the light. Dried blood? Surrounded as she was by the baron's allies, she chose not to reveal what she had just noticed. That was part one of Frank Chadwick's Murder on the Hochflieger Ost. Be sure to check back next week for the exciting conclusion. Well, that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. Praise, thanks, and gratitude to David Weber and Richard Fox for sitting down to talk with me. And of course, thanks to your regular host, Tony Daniel, for letting me sit in today. Tony is actually back in the office this week after a vacation in beautiful Santa Mira, California. You can tell it really did him some good. He's like a completely different person ever since he got back. Like the old Tony was replaced with a calmer, more laid back version of himself. We were talking about how all of us needed a vacation like that. And Tony told each one of us, you're next. I'm gonna have to check out my PTO and see when I can get that scheduled. This is David F. Shirod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. 